The title of this conference is Finishing Faithfully. It speaks about a desire that each of us should have, and that is to serve God faithfully to the very end until He calls us into the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to study an individual tonight, a very important man. In fact, he was one of the kings of Judah, and his name was Asa. And for most of his life, Asa displayed the characteristics that God was well pleased with. He did the right thing. He relied, he trusted upon the God of Israel. But later on in his life, when he had been very successful, has brought prosperity to his nation, he turned away from faith in God and he finished as a failure. So make a decision right now that you are going to remain faithful to God with the desire to finish faithfully until you take that last breath and the Lord calls you into the kingdom of heaven. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Chronicles and chapter 14. Now, I'm going to be reading from the Hebrew, and this verse actually is the last one in chapter 13 in the Hebrew text. But in most other languages, it's the first verse of chapter 14. And it speaks about a transition. Because King Asa, his father, died. And because of that death, now this man became the king of Judah. This kingdom that had at its capital, Jerusalem. He was the most important man in the world. And notice how he began. He began humbly. He began trusting in God, trusting in the word of God. And because of that, it says here at the end of verse 1, in his days. The land, and this is the land of Israel, was quiet, and it was quiet for 10 years. Now, we're going to learn why things were quiet, and this has the connotation of peaceful. Things were stable. God was moving in a blessed way for the children of Judah under the leadership of this man. Look now at, at verse 2. We see here that it says, And Asa did the good. Now, the phrase in Hebrew, Hatov, the good, is in relationship to the will of God. So we can understand it that Asa did that which is good, meaning the will of God, and he did so, not turning to the right or to the left, but the word is yeshar, which means straight. He did that which was good, and he did it in an upright, in a straight manner. Some will also say that this word has to do with in a public way. He didn't conceal his faith, but rather he demonstrated his trust in God. And he administered this kingdom under those principles. And we also find that he did what was good and upright in the eyes of the Lord his God. Now, this speaks about two things. First of all, that this man was one who was in a covenantal relationship with God. How do we know that? Because it says, in his God. Secondly, we see that he acted before the Lord, meaning in the eyes of God, and this is a synonym, rather, teaching about God's perspective. So when it says he did what was good and upright, he had a covenantal relationship with God, and he utilized God's perspective, God's viewpoint, in making decisions. And what was one of the primary things that he did? He moved the children of Judah away from idolatry. Now, we're going to see, as you study this book, 
Israel consistently struggled with idolatry. And idolatry is simply a religious attempt to try to get your way. You will pray, you will do religious things, but in the end, what you want is what you want, not the will of God. And notice how Asa, how he behaved. Look at verse verse 3. And he removed the altars of the foreign, and this means foreign God, a foreign people. He removed the influence that that came outside of, of Israel and Judah. He did not want the people to assimilate, that is to become like the nations. Rather, Israel was called to be an influence, to bring about change, to bring about a cultural difference in this world by teaching the revelation, the illumination of the word of God. So he tore down these altars and also the high places. This is where acts of idolatry and immorality, because in this day, worshiping idols involved an immoral behavior, oftentimes sexually immoral. And he broke down their, their sacred pillars, and he chopped down, and hear this, he chopped down certain trees. And the trees that are mentioned here are the asherim. And this word asherim comes from a, a false promise that you can find happiness and contentment in that which is against the purposes of God. And this really describes the world. The world's not trusting God. The world's not relying upon biblical principles, the truth of God. But rather, they are trying to find pleasure, happiness, satisfaction, be glad in their own desires, their own purposes, their own ways. And Asa, and praise God for this, he stood in opposition. Verse 4. Now he gives some insightful commands to the people those who reside citizens of his kingdom. Verse 4, And he said to Judah, and the next word is the Hebrew word lidrosh, which means to seek with great urgency and commitment. And I want to say that again. His counsel to those who resided in Judah, around Jerusalem and in Jerusalem, he says to seek, Seek with urgency, seek with a great commitment. He says to seek the Lord, the God of our fathers. And when it speaks about our fathers, it's not speaking about just the previous generations, but, but most scholars understand this. This term, our fathers, referring to the patriarchs, to Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov. And whenever the patriarchs are mentioned, you know what should come into our mind? The promises of God. Now, I say this principle often because it's so important. What made these three men, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, pleasing to God is that they were pursuing the promises of God. And in pursuing the promises of God, that pursuit produced faithfulness in their life. So the only way that we are going to finish faithful if we never turn away from desiring the blessings of God, the promises of God, and they are found in a covenantal relationship. When we keep that covenant, we obey the instructions of that covenant for the purpose of pleasing God worshiping him, serving him, and the outcome is going to be God's faithful response back. So he says to Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to do, notice what it says, active word, 
to do the law and the commandments. This is the word Torah. It's God's instructions. And specifically, we see the word mitzvah, commandment. We see that the law instructs us in the commandments of God. And it's only when, and this is a foundational principle, it is only when we apply the commandments to our life that we're living in obedience to God's instruction, then we're going to have that unity. That word mitzvah as commandment in the Hebrew language is related to the word for togetherness. So it's as I walk in obedience to the commandments. I'm not saved by that, but my salvation experience produces that change, that regeneration causes me to want to walk with God, obey God, follow his instructions. And the byproduct of that, and it's a good outcome, that is we experience that intimacy. We find ourselves together with God. So that's why we should see this as an urgent act, one that we should be fully committed to. Verse 5, And he removed from the cities of Judah these high places and also. The next word has to do with objects of worship of the Son. Now, there's a difference because in Judaism, and I'm speaking about the revelation of the Old Testament, we see that, that the moon is of great importance. Not that we worship the moon or anything like that. That would be offensive to God. But the moon teaches a principle. And that is, the moon has no light of its own. The moon reflects the sun. And what the scripture's teaching us here is that we, we have no light of our own. It's only when we reflect the character of God. And how do we do that? Do you realize that there is an inherent relationship between the character of God and the commandments of God? So it's when we take hold of, and let's just make it general, when we take hold of the word of God, then we're going to be living in light of the character of God, displaying what, what he would do, how he would speak, what his priorities would be. We'll become like him. We don't become gods, obviously, but we become like the one true living God. And because of that, it says, and there was quietness, peace in the kingdom before him. See, in this verse, we see why God gave them peace for those 10 years. Drop down, if you would, to verse, verse 6. Where it says, he built these fortified cities in Judah because there was quietness, there was peace. He didn't have to fight battles, and therefore, what did he do? He used this, and this is also an important principle. He used what we would say the benefits, the dividends of his obedience, this peace, this quietness too. Take advantage of that in order to build. And it was this building that brought about great prosperity. He utilized what God provided him in order to strengthen his nation and to bring that which is good to the people. So there was quietness. He built up these fortified cities, and there was not with him war, in these years. Why? Look at the end of verse 6. Because the Lord gave rest to him. Now, the message is this. It was because of Asa's faithfulness, his attack against idolatrous practice, his affinity for the instructions of God, seeking God in a committed way, that God bless this nation. And there was no wars during this period of time. 
Look now to, to verse to verse 7. And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities, and let us place around them a wall and towers and, and gates with bars. While we'll still, while we were still have the opportunity, the land is before us, meaning while there's still peace in the land before us. For we will seek the Lord our God. And we sought, and he gave rest to us all around. And they built, look at the end of, of verse 7. They built, and they were prosperous. Now, King Asa, he took over for his father. And he instituted policies that gave the people the opportunity to edify their nation. When we follow the principles of God, we can build up our families. We can build up our businesses. We can edify things, having a positive influence. And from that, the outcome is going to be a God-given success. Many Bibles speaks about prosperity. God is going to give and supply, and here's the key, in abundance. All of this is good, but it stems from him desiring King Asa to do God's will, to do it in an upright, in a public way, relying upon God's instructions and his commands. Now let's look at verse 8. And it came about to Asa, an army, an army that carried the shield and the spear from Judah, that means from the tribe of Judah, there was 300,000. And from Benjamin, this is the other tribe that was in this southern kingdom, from the tribe of Benjamin, there was those who carried the shield and the bow that bent the bow, 280,000. All of these, all of these 580,000 soldiers. It says here, Gibore Chayil, which means that they were mighty in valor. It means that they were a type of hero. Any one of them would do that which is mighty, heroic for this, this nation. He was exceedingly blessed. Now, what happens? Well, notice in this next verse, verse 9. Here we see something. Things were good, and when things are good, the enemy's not pleased. And even though that he has had peace, the land was quiet in his days, that God had given them rest. Now we see something. We see the enemy is going to attack. Look again at, at verse 9. And went out unto them a man by the name of Zerach. He was an Ethiopian. And his army, he went out with an army of a thousand thousands, which is a million. Now, Judah is outnumbered. They have 580,000, but Ethiopia coming up from Africa towards Judah. They have almost twice the number of soldiers. And they also had, if we read carefully, they had 300 chariots. And they came unto a place called Marasha. Now, Marasha is in Judah. It is not far from a city that is about 20 minutes by, by car. It's called Bet Shemesh. And it's in the southern portion of Israel, but still in the upper Negev, meaning that they are close. The enemy in Marasha is close to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a great threat against her. What is now King Asa going to do? 
He has not inquired or encountered the attack of the enemy. Notice his response. Look now to, to, verse, to verse 10. And Asa went out before him, wasn't a coward. War was coming, he went out to the battle. And he arranged, he got things ready for war. In the valley of Sarfata, close to Marasha. And what did he do? Well, he positioned himself in the right place. And it was because he was located in the right place that he could call upon the Lord. He relied, he trusted in God. Look at verse 11. And Asa called to the Lord his God. Here again, this phrase, his God, speaks of a covenantal relationship. And a covenant is established in faith, in trust. So Asa goes forth. He's located in the right location. And he calls. Now, this is not the word for crying out in fear. It is not a call of desperation, but it's a call of faithfulness. And he says, Lord, there is none with you to help between many and those that have no power. Now, this is an idiom. What it literally means is this. It doesn't matter. If, if you are with us, God, it doesn't matter if there is no one that helps us and the enemy is, is abundantly prepared. Numerous soldiers. What he's saying is this. He's making a public profession. This is a public call to God of his trust, of his reliance, of, and this is important, of his dependence upon God. And therefore, he says here in this passage of Scripture, we read that he says, Help us, O Lord our God, for unto you we have relied. And this is a word that means have sought support. In your name we have come unto this multitude. O Lord our God, you, you are not going to, to be stopped by, by human means. What he's saying is this, God, I want everyone to know that I realize that it doesn't matter who's with the enemy. It doesn't matter what human force and possessions they have, what their weapons are. Because no human alone can stop you. He is confident that God provides victory. Let me ask you that question. When you encounter the, the coming attack of the enemy, if you are about God's purposes, doing his will, accomplishing his desires, you can be assured of something. It doesn't matter what the opposition is. doesn't matter how great, how powerful, how numerous. No human individual, no human weapon can be fashioned against God. And God can not only overcome the natural, but also the supernatural forces of evil, of darkness. God is never, ever defeated. So we need to make sure that we are upon his side. Verse, verse 11. What we see here is the Lord did something. The Lord struck, and this is a word like plague. He placed a plague upon the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And what do we see? Well, for the sake of time, we see that, that the Ethiopians fled and Judah, Judah 
pursued after. And in doing so, they defeated this great army of Ethiopia. And they took great plunder, spoil from the enemy. God gave them a reward. Why? That's God's nature. God is a faithful God when we trust Him, when we rely upon Him, when we are dependent upon Him and demonstrate that dependence by obeying His Word. What are we going to see? We are going to see that God delivers. God grants us victory because it's His victory. We share in His victory. And not only we share in the defeat of the enemy, but there's going to be a reward. The children of Judah, they plundered the enemy. And not just Ethiopia, but also they fought and the people, the nations around Judah, they also plundered them as well. And in the end, we see here that they returned to Jerusalem victoriously, prosperously, and closer to God. Now look at chapter 15. In chapter 15, we see prophecy. Now, what this teaches us, and this is a foundational principle, you need to learn it if you're going to grow and mature in your faith. And that's this. As you obey God, that act of obedience, that act of trust, doing what God would have you to do, is going to position you where you are able to receive greater revelation. God grows your perspective. Right now, in the midst of disobedience, you see things incorrectly. When we are living disobediently, we are going to be looking at the lies, the distortion of the enemy. But when we begin to turn in obedience to God, walking in faith, we know, Paul says this, that it's an upward call. And as we rise up, God lifts us up. He brings us closer and closer to seeing things from his perspective, a heavenly, a kingdom perspective. And that's why we see after this victory and that there was a, a financial prosperity. Notice what it says, chapter 15 and verse 1. And Azariahu, which means the Lord helps. Azariahu, the son of Oded. That name Oded means encouragement. So we see this man and his father. His name is God has helped or helps. And his father's name is encouragement. And there was unto him the spirit of God. Learn, I say this also very frequently. When the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, is mentioned, more often than not, that is to tell us that God's going to bring order. And he brings order into our life through revelation, prophetic truth. Look now to verse 2. And he went out before Asa. And he said to him, Listen to me, Asa. And all of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. Now, I would highly recommend you writing that down. It is not enough just to, to hear it, but you need to write it down. Look at it. Say it over and over. A very important biblical truth. The Lord is with you when you are with him. So, so never pray, God, come over here and, and help me out. Be where God is. 
Be in the midst of His will. Pray. If you want assistance, then you get where God is. You do the things that God's Spirit is moving in, what He's up to. And then we can have that confidence, that assurance of God's help, God's ministry unto us. Notice what else it says. And if you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you abandon Him, if you leave Him, He will leave you. So seek Him, He'll be found. But if you leave Him, He will leave you. Now, this is prophetic because all of what's happened is to position Asa and the nation of Judah for a greater victory. See, God, learn this, God is not easily satisfied because God has greater and greater and greater plans for us. So we're not someone who serves God and then we just sit back and enjoy that that former victory. God has another victory, a greater one and a greater one. That's why he grows us. He empowers us. He strengthens us so that we can do more against the enemy. So a principle, not hard to understand. God is with the one who is with him. If you seek him, he will be found. But if you abandon him, if you forsake him, if you, it's simply the word lazov, if you leave him, then he will leave you. We're going to close this first session with those biblical principles. And we're going to come back for the second session to see how did Asa do? Up until this time, he has been a, a, a strong man of God. He has walked in obedience. He has relied upon God. He is dependent upon, dependent upon him. But now there's going to be another test. And you know what? There always is. But this test is not to tempt us to do what is wrong. But it is a test that we will put into practice what God, and really hear this, what God has already revealed to us. It's not by coincidence that this man of God, this prophet, Azar Yahu, the son of Oded, comes. God has helped. God will encourage. That's what those names mean. And he gives him this foundational truth. God is with those who are with him. If we find God, if we seek God, we'll find him. But those who forsake God, God will forsake. This is a warning, a warning to Asa, but also it is awarded to us. Well, we'll close this first session with that. But after our break, we'll come back and we'll see how Asa fares, how he acted, behaved, what he accomplished towards the end of his life. Did he finish faithfully? 